back. It's Hugh Hewitt, Cleveland, Ohio edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show on this Friday before Labor Day weekend. I know many of you in your cars and driving. I'm keeping my eye on the news. If anything happened in Syria, we don't expect that until next week. I would, of course, let you know. Coming up next hour of the Hillsdale Dialogues with Dr. Larry Aram. But a fascinating conversation ahead now. Before I get in my car and head over to Put-In Bay for the Bicentennial of the Battle of Lake Erie, with Dr. Stephen C. Meyer. Uh, Dr. Meyer received his Ph.D. from the University of Cambridge in the philosophy of science after he worked as an oil industry geophysicist. He now directs the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute in Seattle, Washington. He authored Signature in the Cell, which was a Times Literary Supplement Book of the Year. And he has a brand new book out, which is a bestseller titled Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. Dr. Meyer, welcome. It's great to have you on the program. It's great to be with you, Hugh. You know, talking with a Washington State person, though, here I am in the middle of the heartland in Ohio, and I, I have trouble sometimes thinking of Washington State as actually being part of the uh, the lower 48. It can be kind of rainy here, almost like Alaska, you're right. And kind of left-wing, almost like Europe. On the west side of the mountains, that is definitely the case. Now, why did the Discovery Institute end up being in Seattle, Washington? Well, our founders, uh, George Gilder and Bruce Chapman, were both active in the Reagan administration, uh, Bruce directly in the administration, but he had been um, a politician in, in Seattle and Washington State. He'd run for governor out here, and after the Reagan years were over, he came back out. He wanted to start a think tank away from the Beltway, and especially Discovery has focused on issues of science and technology, and Seattle has been a major player in the tech industry, and this turned out to be a really a perfect place to do the kind of work we've been doing doing. Well, it is. And the Discovery Institute, extraordinary on so many different levels. And this is a great book. I want to tell people that it's one of the most interesting sets of endorsements, and they're done for a particular reason. We've got a paleontologist at Mount Holyoke College. We have a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School. We have senior scientist emeritus at the Max Planck Institute for Plant Breeding Research. We've got a professor of biochemistry at the University of Georgia, professor of biology at State University of New York. And then we have Dean Koontz, uh, you know, one of the greatest authors in America, extraordinarily powerful writer who writes, Myers writes beautifully. He marshals complex information as well as any writer I've read this book, Darwin's Doubt, and his body of work challenges scientism with real science and excites in me the hope that the origins of life debate will soon be largely free of the ideology that has long colored it. A wonderful, most compelling read. Wow, that's high praise, Stephen Meyer. Well, we were kind of pleased with that one. The editor at Harper first thought, well, this guy isn't a scientist, but he was excited about it because I wrote the book as a story, and it's an argument, but it's also a story. It's the story of a doubt that Darwin had about his own theory and how that doubt has grown up to generate, in fact, a major crisis in evolutionary biology. So we uh, put Kuntz's uh, endorsement on there very intentionally because we wanted people to know that this was accessible and it would be a good read as well as something that was consequential in the context of this larger scientific debate about biological origins. But I also like that you surrounded him with the PhDs so that the scientific community and the lay reader understands this is a serious work of science, history of science, but also written in a style that a layman like me, and I'm not Mr. Science, I'm never going to host that show, that we can understand, and, and you worked hard to make this for the lay reader accessible. Well, I did. I had the experience of teaching college freshmen for 12 years before I came to Discovery full-time, and my colleagues used to tease me that I'd stand on my head to make things accessible. I had all kinds of goofy visual aids and gags and stuff i do in class, so I really worked hard in the book to explain the science that the ordinary reader needs to understand the argument that I'm making, but I also needed to make it rigorous so that the specialist would know that the argument had force. Now, I have a technical question for you. There are many beautiful illustrations in drawings. I'm looking at, for example, page 160 do on different number of cell types, organ grade, etc. Who did all this stuff? We've got a wonderful artist here in Seattle named Ray Braun, and he did illustrations for my first book in a distinctive pen and ink style, and they were so popular we decided to reprise the same kind of art. But of course, with the fossils that I'm talking about with this event in the history of life known as the Cambrian Explosion, there's some nice eye candy too, so we've got some color inserts of beautiful pictures of fossils, particularly from a location in southern China where recent finds have really shaken up the evolutionary consensus. Now, in this first segment, I want you to give the thesis statement for the book, and then we'll work back through it. But 
present the overall Darwin's doubt that you have to read at length to get the full nuance and argument force. But what's the thesis statement? Sure, that's a great place to start. The book's title does kind of tell the story of the book. Darwin had a doubt that he expressed in The Origin of Species about the adequacy of his own theory. And the doubt concerned an event in the history of life that's known as the Cambrian Explosion. And the Cambrian Explosion is the first appearance of most of the major animal groups that have ever lived on Earth. And they appear very discontinuously or abruptly in the fossil record, quite to the contrary of what Darwin expected. He thought that his mechanism of natural selection acting on random variations would need to work very slowly and gradually. If the variations from one generation to another were too great, deformed organisms would result and the evolutionary process would terminate with the death of those organisms. So variations had to be small, which meant that the evolutionary process had to work very slowly and gradually. And yet what we see in the fossil record is that the first appearance of the major groups of animals appear very abruptly or discontinuously. This troubled Darwin, and what I do in the book is I tell about the doubt that he had in its time, but then I trace the story of the progressive attempts that have been made to resolve that doubt within evolutionary theory and show how that doubt has actually become more acute for a number of reasons and has left us with a major crisis that many evolutionary biologists themselves are acknowledging, even though we still have in the media the presentation of the theory as something that is completely beyond any questioning. And the reason you have that prejudice against any alternative in your your alternative thesis is that there is intelligent design at work in the Cambrian explosion, correct? Right, and that you can see the evidence for that intelligent design in some of the key features of animal life. One of the things that we know about that Darwin didn't know about is the centrality, the importance of information, and by that I mean the digital code that is stored in the DNA molecule that's absolutely necessary for maintaining and building new living forms of life. I used to ask my students when I was teaching, if you want to give your computer a new function, and very techie would know you've got to give it code or software or instructions, and it turns out there's a big discovery of 20th century biology. The same thing is true in life. If you want to build a new form of animal life, you have to have information, digital information stored in DNA and other forms of information in order to build these complex forms of animal life. And that turns out to be the deepest mystery of the Cambrian, not just the missing ancestor fossils, but really this engineering problem of how would this slow, gradual, undirected, and completely materialistic process generate all this information that we see arising in the history of life. Now, this will shock a lot of people that there is this crisis in evolutionary biology, and it's about this period, but they should not be shocked because of the scientism that Dean Coots referred to. I have one example of that that is personal to me. Richard Dawkins was a guest on this show. I want to play for you, Stephen Meyer, just a touch of that exchange. Do you believe Jesus turned water into wine? Yes. You seriously do? Yes. You actually think that Jesus got water and made all those molecules turn into wine? Yes. My God. Yes. Okay. My I, God, actually, not yours. But <laughs> let me I realize the kind of person I'm dealing with now. The, the kind of person I'm dealing with now was educated by Stephen Gould in natural selection at Harvard and spent an hour with him talking about his wonderful book on evolution just before this. But the antipathy, Stephen Myers, to the argument, the hostility from people like Dawkins, which was never on the part, by the way, of Christopher Hitchens, who was often a guest on this program, never that kind of venom. But you run into that, don't you? Well, this is one of the themes of my new book, is that there's a huge disparity between the media and public presentation of the status of evolutionary theory and the actual status as you find it in the peer-reviewed scientific literature, including within the field of evolutionary biology itself. Dawkins is exhibit A in that disparity because he is known for this kind of rhetorical excess. He's also said that anyone who questions evolutionary theory is either stupid, ignorant, or insane, and then he adds, or possibly wicked, but he'd prefer not to think about that. And Dawkins said that in the New York Times. Not surprisingly, the New York Times science writer Cornelia Dean has repeatedly said that there's no controversy whatsoever about evolutionary theory and all the major public science organizations, National Academy of Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, all have made similar statements. And yet when you get into the peer-reviewed literature within evolutionary biology, what you find today is that not only are some evolutionary biologists calling for a new 
evolutionary theory because they recognize that the, the neo-Darwinian theory of mutation and natural selection, that that mechanism doesn't have the creative power that has long been attributed to it. But you also have evolutionary biologists themselves furiously working on generating new theories of evolution because they know that the, the standard mechanisms don't work. It's don't broken. We'll be right back to continue that conversation with Dr. Stephen Meyer, his new book, Darwin's Doubt, linked at hughhewitt.com. Welcome back, America. It's a beautiful evening in Cleveland, Ohio, where I am broadcasting tonight on Friday. This hour devoted to a conversation with uh, Stephen Meyer, author of a brand new book, Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. It's a bestseller. It's in bookstores everywhere. And uh, you can get it from the Discovery Institute website as well if you would like to do that. But uh, it's not hard to find. We were talking about the crisis in evolutionary biology that is presented by the Cambrian Explosion. And Dr. Meyer, I want to read to you one of my favorite passages from the book on page 93. To see what's wrong with this way of thinking, which is neo-Darwinian, imagine an ambitious distance swimmer claiming that it would be possible to swim between California and Hawaii over a period of many months or years because the small islands that provide way stations where he could eat, rest, and overnight at each stage along his marathon journey. But instead of showing that an archipelago dotting the route between California and Hawaii at reasonably accessible interval actually exists, he points to a couple of barren atolls in the South Pacific, far from the most likely course to Hawaii. Clearly, in that case, the claims of our intrepid hypothetical swimmer would not be credible. In a similar way, the claims of those who assert that a few isolated and anatomically enigmatic forms of life in the pre-Cambrian period solved the problem of the Cambrian explosion also lack credibility. Beautiful analogy, by the way. Beautiful analogy. What would uh, Richard Dawkins say to that? Well, actually, he has said that the Cambrian animals look as if they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. And this is one of the odd things about the debate, is that many of the evolutionary biologists are quite candid about the problems associated with evolutionary theory when they are writing to each other in their own technical literature, or even sometimes, as Dawkins did in this case, they slip up in public. But then they will tell you that other evidence compensates for the lack of fossils, the evidence from genetics, for example. And I have a couple chapters in the book showing that, yes, there are people who argue that, but the genetic evidence... Is is as ambiguous and unsupportive of the Darwinian synthesis as the paleontological evidence is as well. I want to come back to that next segment in my outline. I want to talk about the genetic evidence. Let's stay on the Cambrian explosion. Explain to people what happened, uh, the degree of variation that that occurred that cast into doubt the idea that this was all gradually developing. Right. Well, the Cambrian documents the appearance of what are called the phyla. And phyla are just the largest division in biological classifications. And they represent unique body plans. A body plan is a unique arrangement of body parts and tissues. So you might think about, by analogy, something as different as a car, an airplane, and a boat. Three different modes of transportation, but three radically different ways of arranging parts to accomplish a transportation function. So in the Cambrian, you have have about 23 of the 27 known fossilized phyla first appearing. 20 of those phyla first appear in the Cambrian, and three appear in the very late Precambrian, but even they appear as suddenly and discontinuously as the ones that later appear in the Cambrian. So what you have is a pervasive pattern of appearance of the major innovations in the history of life. The mutation selection mechanism does a good job of explaining minor variations, things like finch beaks getting a little longer or shorter in response to changing environmental or climate patterns in the Galapagos Islands. But many scientists now question that it can explain these major innovations. One evolutionary biologist has said that natural selection explains well the survival, but not the arrival of the fittest. All right, so let me ask if... The big change. Let me ask, are you putting forward for the layman a proposition that it is possible that there's sort of a cosmic Johnny Appleseed at that period of time planting these phyla? Well, what I'm arguing is that what we see in the animal forms themselves is evidence that we know from experience only arises from one kind of cause, and that cause is intelligence. If you think about information, especially information in a typographic or digital form, 
and you think about what we know about where information of that form comes from. What we know is that information always arises from an intelligent source, whether we're talking about a hieroglyphic inscription or a section of digital code in a computer program or a paragraph in a book. When we trace information back to its source, we always come to an intelligent source. And so when we realize that the Cambrian explosion is not just an explosion of new animal forms, but also a massive explosion of new genetic and other forms of biological information, I argue that what we're looking at, therefore, is evidence of a purposive intelligence playing a role in the history of life, in particular at that major junction in the history of life where we see all this innovation of form and structure and of information. Because, and the reason I use the Johnny Appleseed analogy is it. The, the apple trees that Appleseed planted wouldn't be there unless he had a design to go and plant them there. Exactly. And it's a good analogy because the seed contains a lot of information that then unfolds over time. So we're not denying that there might be subsequent evolution, but the point is the evolution that's possible within groups of organisms is made possible because of a pre-existing source of information. And it's that pre-existing information that I argue is the locus of the design that we see in the history of life. And I argue that it's the product of intelligence intelligent design, not just the apparent design that you sometimes hear Darwinists talking about. Now, here's the key question for me, Dr. Stephen Meyer. From the Cambrian period forward, do you believe that natural selection accounts for life as we know it today? I'm skeptical that it accounts for all of the innovation that we see in the history of life. The Cambrian is merely the most significant example of major innovation in the history of life. But there are other events. For example, the mammalian radiation, as it's called in paleontology, where you get 15 to 17 new orders of mammals in a very brief window of geologic time. There are a number of events like this in the history of life. It is, for me, a, a something of an open question as to how much change known evolutionary mechanisms can generate and where the junctions are where we would need to look at the possibility of an infusion of information from outside the source by a designing agent. But I think the Cambrian is a great place to address that question because it is the most significant innovation in the history of life. And I think it clearly provides evidence of design in the history of life. Within those people who are puzzled by the Cambrian, that community of honest evolutionists, would they argue that if you can explain the Cambrian, natural selection could take over from there. There are an increasing number of scientists who are sympathetic to intelligent design, but many of those who are expressing skepticism about the creative power of the mutation natural selection mechanism and, and its ability to generate things like whole new animal body plans are themselves evolutionary biologists who are committed by their own sense of prior philosophical belief to a strictly materialistic explanation for everything in the history of life. So they are recognizing, many of those evolutionary scientists are recognizing the problems with standard neo-Darwinian theory, but they're trying to solve the problem within a materialistic framework. So they are attempting to generate new evolutionary theories that are equally materialistic, but which would invoke some other mechanisms that they would hope would have more creative power. I'll be right back with Dr. Stephen Meyer. His brand new book is Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. I'll be right back on the Hugh Hewitt Show. 34 minutes after the hour, America, it's Hugh Hewitt from Cleveland. Hope you're enjoying the program. The Hillsdale Dialogues next hour, but I'm talking this hour with Stephen Meyer of the Discovery Institute. Dr. Meyer, of course, got his PhD from the University of Cambridge. He is director of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute in Seattle. His brand new book, Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. In bookstores everywhere. How's it doing, by the way, Stephen? Well, we've been really pleased at the initial uh, reception of the book, and uh, I was quite shocked one afternoon in, in July to get a call from my editor, Harper, letting me know it had made one of the big bestseller lists. So I'm, I'm uh, pleased, and uh, it's also generating a lot of heat on the Internet, as you can imagine. We had uh, 3 o'clock the night the book was released on Amazon. There were already a whole slew of one-star hostile reviews that had been uploaded, and one guy posted a 9,400-word review of the book the next day. The book is, of course, 400 pages, so he was a pretty speedy reader and writer. So obviously this issue, it generates a lot of passion on both sides. Will Dawkins debate you? We challenged him. I challenged him once on one of your colleagues' programs, Michael Medved, but he has declined that opportunity. Now, you see, what that tells me is he's very much afraid of you, and as a result, not 
confident of his own certainty. To me, you know, by the way, as I'm sure many Roman Catholics have told you for a long time, I got no dog in this fight. I can go either way. Natural selection doesn't bother me in the least. You know, God can work any way he wants. And the Vatican got there years ago. I know that there's some young earthers out there probably throwing stones at your car, but, you know, I just don't go with them. So it's very funny to me, their anti-intellectualism. I agree. And one of the ways that's manifest is this prior commitment to a materialistic explanation, regardless of what kind of evidence you're looking at. The famous evolutionary biologist Richard Lewinton, who years ago in, I think it was commentary, wrote an interesting article where he said, we opt for the materialistic scientific perspective in spite of its counterintuitive elements because we have a prior commitment to materialistic explanation. And there was a review of my new book in The New Yorker in July and the reviewer paid me a number of backhanded compliments, one of which was that it was a masterpiece of pseudoscience. And I thought that was really interesting because you have to ask yourself the question, why is the argument for intelligent design deemed pseudoscience by some? And it's because they have this prior commitment to explaining everything by reference to purely materialistic, unguided forces. But I think that's an anti-intellectual commitment because there are many things that we know of that we wouldn't explain by reference to purely mindless forces, one of which is information. If you go into the British Museum and you look at the Rosetta Stone, at those beautiful inscriptions in three different languages, you won't say, gee, isn't it wonderful what wind and erosion did? You'll recognize immediately the product of a prior mind, the activity of intelligence. And that's the kind of argument I'm making for intelligent design. It's based on the distinctive hallmarks of intelligent activity as we find them in the living world. And to deny them and to insist that we explain everything by materialistic causes, I think, is anti-intellectual, and it's certainly against what we know from our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning. Now, also in Darwin's Doubt, you have a a segment on DNA research and how originally, and and I love Bill Bryson when it comes to science writing, and I love a brief history of nearly everything, because he's always quick to point out that scientists are so often wrong about everything, and that everything we learned, I'm 57, everything Bryson learned, he's older than I am, in our science textbooks in eighth grade, it's all wrong. They were completely 100% wrong about everything, Big Bang especially. And so he's very suspicious of scientific certainty. And that is so well on display in Darwin's doubt because of the DNA argument that most of it was useless, but in fact, none of it is. So would you tell people that very quickly in in a couple of minutes? Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate your alerting your audience to the problem of alleged consensus in science, because that's being used as a, a way of bullying people into believing all kinds of things, when the whole point of science is that we have to question consensus and that scientists need the freedom to debate how to interpret evidence. And if there is a consensus, we've got to give them the freedom to challenge it because that's how science progresses. But one of the consensus views, and it follows directly out of a Darwinian perspective, is that much of the genome is so-called junk. In the 1980s, it was discovered that about 3% of the genome codes for building what are called proteins, the machinery that the cell needs to stay alive, and 97% of it at that point had no known function. The conclusion was immediately jumped to that this was the junk DNA that you would expect if the mutation selection mechanism was generating all this detritus over time. These are all the failed attempts of the trial and error mutation selection mechanism. But advocates of intelligent design in the 90s said, well, look, if our theory is true, we would predict those non-protein coding regions would not turn out to be junk, but would instead have important functions. And hold that thought, because this is key, America. Don't go anywhere over the break. That's a terrible tease. But I do have to do my break from Cleveland. The book is Darwin's Doubt. It's linked at HughHewitt.com. Stay tuned. Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. You are going to have to get Darwin's Doubt for yourself, because I'm just scratching on the surface as we roll along here. Dr. Stephen Meyer is my guest. Darwin's Doubt is his brand new book. He is the director of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute in Seattle. And this is a book about the history of, of what happened when Darwin said, boy, this Cambrian period, I cannot explain it. And part of the joy of this book is seeing where scientific certainty gets smashed up. And in the 80s, our lifetime, many of the listeners right now, when the genome was first sort of explored in detail, there was this theory that 97% of it was simply irrelevant to the functioning of the human life. And what happened next, Stephen Meyer? 
Well, what's turned out has been exactly the opposite. We've learned that the non-coding regions of the genome are functional and that overall they function something like an operating system in a computer, meaning that they control the timing and expression of the data files, the parts of the genome that do code for proteins. And this has been a byproduct of a lot of research, some of it under the heading of the ENCODE project, much of which was published last fall. So it's an unexpected result from a Darwinian point of view and actually a result that has confirmed a specific prediction of the theory of intelligent design. Now, as a result, there's been some movement in the scientific community in your direction, hasn't there? Well, what we're seeing happening is a lot of, you know, high-profile denunciation of intelligent design as being not science by definition, but we are seeing a lot of movement of individual scientists, both here in the United States and internationally. There's a new journal called Biocomplexity that has a very distinguished editorial board. Some of the scientists are members of national academies in their own countries. This journal was founded to explore the scientific evidence for intelligent design and to test it experimentally. So there's a growing research community community worldwide interested in this idea, and certainly a huge amount of skepticism about the standard textbook evolutionary theory known as neo-Darwinism, which is still extolled by people in the media as something that is beyond question. Now, uh, Stephen Meyer, a lot of people come into the middle of a show, uh, average time spent listening to any radio show is 24, 25 minutes, even I've got a huge average time spent listening, so I want to be careful to make sure that we restate the overall premise of Darwin's doubt and why the book is organized as it is for lay people and and specialists alike. Can you do that for us? You bet. Darwin's doubt tells the story of a doubt that Darwin had about his own theory and how that doubt has grown up to be illustrative of a major problem in evolutionary theory. And that problem has two parts. One, the problem of the missing fossil ancestors to these major animals that arise in a period of geologic history known as the Cambrian. But the second mystery that I address in the book is really an engineering mystery. How could the evolutionary process, which relies on random changes in the characters of the genetic text generate all the reams and reams of information that are necessary to build new animal forms. And in the book, I argue that that needed information is actually best explained by a purpose of intelligence playing a role in the history of life, in particular in this key event known as the Cambrian Explosion. Now, Stephen Meyer, one of the hallmarks of intellectual honor is that you can state the best argument of the other side. I've heard you do this before, so I'm going to ask you, where are the missing fossils? fossils in the perspective of the neo-Darwinians? Where do they say they are? Why can't we find them? Well, one of the things I do in the book is look at the different attempts that have been made to solve that mystery. And I look at several of them, and it's hard to say which one of them is more prominent. But one of the main attempts has been to say, well, the fossils are missing because they weren't preserved, because the ancestors of the Cambrian were animals that were either too soft or too small to have been preserved. And I show in the book that that was a going concern for quite a while. But recently, that argument, it's known as the artifact hypothesis, has come in to some disrepute, I think, because of a major find in China where in the pre-Cambrian layers, just before layers of rock that document the explosion in China, you have newly discovered embryo fossils there. They appear to be fossils of sponges, so they are soft and microscopic, and yet they were preserved in the pre-Cambrian strata. If the depositional environment at that time was capable of preserving those soft, small creatures, it raises this huge question, why didn't they also preserve the ancestors of all the other animal forms that we see arising a little bit later in the Cambrian period? This artifact hypothesis doesn't seem to wash anymore. Okay, so that's one of their major potential explanations. What's another one? Another one would be to say, well, the fossils aren't telling the story, but the genes are. We see in the similarity of gene sequences in different animals representing these different major groups, patterns that allow us to reconstruct a pre-Cambrian tree of life, which implies the existence of these ancestral forms. The problem with that argument, and I, I go into a couple chapters of detail on this in the book, is number one, depending on which genes and proteins you choose to analyze, you get very different reconstructions of the pre-Cambrian tree of life. They're contradictory, and yet there could be only one history. So if these genes are sending us an accurate historical signal, we shouldn't have these conflicting trees, and yet we do. But secondly, the whole method of reconstructing the pre-Cambrian evolutionary past from genes 
presupposes that the degree of difference between two gene sequences is a measure of how long ago they diverged from a common ancestor. In other words, the whole method presupposes the very thing they're trying to prove, which is the existence of these ancestral organisms. And so it's actually a question-begging method of reasoning, and I show that in the book as well. Last question in this segment. This week, I had an MSNBC host hang up on me. Because I asked, her, I just heard about that from yeah. a colleague. Yeah, yeah. A, a question that they couldn't answer, which is, was Alger his a communist? Because to answer it is either she didn't know, or possibly she was just ignorant. But to answer it leads to the destruction of the argument. What questions would the audience be well equipped with when they run into a Darwinian certaintist? Most of whom, by the way, are certain without any regard for debate and don't actually have the background. They just latched on to certainty and they wave names like Dawkins around without having done the work. Well, I think the crucial questions have to do with this engineering problem. I was mentioning almost all the reviews in my book so far have attempted to quibble about little details of paleontology. The main one has been, well, the Cambrian took longer than Meyer says. We've shown on our science blog, Evolution News, uh, my colleague Casey Luskin has a decisive rebuttal of that factual claim showing that the duration that I use is the standard date within paleontology. But that's that's a quibble. The main argument that I'm making is that the mutation selection mechanism does not have the creative power to generate all the digital code and other forms of information necessary to build these new forms of animal life. And so if if you're in a discussion with a Darwinian, you really need to frame this as an engineering question. How do we get purely random changes in genes generating all these new sections of genetic code? That's a really difficult problem. And in the book, I explain more why that's the case. So it'd be good to be armed with some of the details of those arguments. I'll be right back. One final segment with Stephen Meyer after the break. His book is Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design. But you can equip yourself with a uh, the latest issue in the most important debate for many scientists, the debate over how we got here. Darwin's Doubt is a major contribution to that field. Stephen C. Meyer, its author, will be right back with me after the break. Stay tuned. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show. Welcome back, America. I want to thank uh, Dr. Stephen Meyer for spending an hour with me, a lot of time. His brand new book, Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design, is in bookstores now, and it's available at my website. It's everywhere, actually. You close the book, Chapter 20, What's at Stake? And that's how I want to close our... We have a little segment here, three minutes, Stephen Meyer. Can you tell people why you bother? I mean, why devote your life to this? It would have been so much easier just to go along with the flow here. Absolutely true. At the same time, it's the most fascinating issue, I think. It's a scientific issue. The scientific evidence and arguments are fascinating in their own right. But this is also an issue that has larger worldview implications. Every worldview has to answer the question, what is the thing or the entity or the process from which everything else comes? And we've been told for 150 years that a purely unguided, undirected, and purely materialistic process produced all the forms of life we see around us. And that has led to, in our culture, a dominant worldview that's sometimes known as scientific materialism, sometimes also known as scientism. And I've become intrigued with the idea that scientific materialism can be challenged by science itself, that the science is not pointing in a strictly materialistic direction. Obviously, that does generate a lot of heat and controversy. I've got a debating partner, a friendly debating partner, Michael Ruse, who is a staunch Darwinist himself, who does agree to debates. And Ruse has written... uh, I think a very important book in which he acknowledges that Darwinian evolution has functioned as a kind of secular religion for many scientists. And I think it's fascinating that that secular religion is now under pressure from the evidence of science itself. And I think the evidence that I look at doesn't provide a proof for God's existence, but it does point in a theistic friendly direction and does open our minds to a a worldview that I think is less dehumanizing than the materialistic one. I thought you were going to say that. I want to close with this question. Do you believe that, and I want to draw, take a parallel from religious history, which will really drive the evolutionists crazy, the Darwinians, I should say. Do you believe that there is a reformation brewing as brewed within Christianity among the scientism advocates of the most extreme sort? Well, I think that scientism and materialism is being challenged. It's being challenged partly by the evidence, but what we're also seeing is there is a lot of subterranean dissent, and the dissenters are finding each other, and there's a big community of scientists worldwide that are really unhappy with the received wisdom that, that's come down to us from the late 19th century, which is where we got this, you know, we got Darwin, Marx, Freud, all the great materialistic thinkers of the 19th century have shaped the 20th, and I think there is a revolution coming, in part because in the 19th century, we thought everything was matter and 
energy. And we now know there's a third fundamental entity in, in nature, and that's information. And information is something you can't account for apart from mind. So the mind over matter view of reality is starting to trump this old-fashioned materialism. Stephen Meyer, congratulations. Fascinating book, Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design is Everywhere. Thanks to the Discovery Institute for all its great work. I'll be right back. America, the Hillsdale Dialogue is next on this Friday, Cleveland edition of the Hugh Hewitt Show. This program was recorded by Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. ID the Future is copyright Discovery Institute 2013. For more information, visit www.intelligentdesign.org or www.idthefuture.com.